Welcome everyone to our webinar today about data visualization. We're very excited to have everybody here and really looking forward to hearing our speaker. Um, my name is Amber Malinowski. I'm the Director of Content Communications at Weave. And just before we get started, I'll go over a few housekeeping things. If you have never been to a Zoom webinar before, this is what your control panel probably looks like. Over on the far left, you can control if you have audio through your computer or through your phone. You can also chat with us if you are having any difficulties or you need anything. And we also, there's a way you can raise your hand. We have most of our questions come in through that Q&A area, especially at the end. So if you have questions for the presenter, anytime during the presentation, you can pose those there. And we will also have a, a section at the end where we'll read those and she'll be able to answer. We will be doing a couple of polls right in the beginning just to get to know a little bit more about you. And then if you need to leave for any reason, you can either close out of your window or actually leave the webinar on the far right. We are recording the session today, so if um, you need a copy of that or if you know anyone who would like to watch it after the fact, then you'll be able to access that afterwards. It will also include a PDF of the slides and a couple of other resources that will be being covered, so we'll have all of that in here. We do have a survey that pops up at the end. We'd really appreciate it if you could take just a couple of minutes. It's just a few questions. Um, give us a little feedback so that we can shape our webinars for the future. And with that, I'm going to let um, Dr. Ray Van Dyke, go ahead and introduce our speaker. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Amber. And yes, thank all of you for coming. I'm so pleased to be here and um, presenting this webinar today. If you tuned in with us a couple of weeks ago, we had a webinar talking about um, telling your assessment story, of course, primarily using words. And what we're going to be talking about today, our, our wonderful speaker, is also about telling your assessment story but telling it with a visualization, which um, is always helpful. Um, you know, so many times when we're passing around um, all, all sorts of, of information that people have to sit and read and go through, and it's, it gets kind of difficult to get to the real um, gist of what assessment is doing at your institution or in your program. So you're going to love this. I've seen this presentation. Our speaker is Dr. Courtney Vangren, who is the Director of Curricular Assessment and Teaching Sports and, and also an assistant teaching professor at Iowa State University and the College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, she has a very varied background, which um, she will, I think, talk a, a bit about. But if you read the description of her bio, uh, she is a self-proclaimed data nerd and does loves doing this kind of work. Um, I have seen this presentation and I've talked with her a lot and it's, I'm sure, going to be something that's going to be very helpful. I, I feel like, um, at the end of this uh, webinar, you're going to be able to walk away and have several very, very good uh, tools in your toolkit to help with this visualization. So we're so glad that she's here and I'll turn it back over. I think Amber's going to do the polls. Yes, and we should probably let Dr. Vengren say hello. <laughs> Sure, yes, I'm so excited to um, get to hear from you all and thank you um, like uh, Ray said and Amber, thank you all for joining us today. We have a couple polls that Amber is going to administer just so I can kind of get um, a feel for who is out there in the audience. Um, so I will let her do those and then we'll switch back over to me. So our first poll, do you consider yourself well versed in Excel? This must be an easy question. The, the polls are, it's, it's almost done. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it up here just for another moment. Make sure everybody has a chance to respond. Okay, it looks pretty close. I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll and share the results. So 78% of you said yes and 22% of you said no. Let's go on to our next poll. Are you an assessment professional? Okay, everybody's just about finished. All right.
And for this one, 87% of you said that you are assessment professionals and 13% said that no, you are not. And our final poll, do you feel confident with your data visualization abilities? Okay, we're just about there. All right, I'm going to share this one as well. So this one's completely different. Um, only 29% of people said that yes, they were confident. 71% that said that no, they are not. So hopefully by the end of our session, you'll have lots of ideas about how to, how to be more confident in that. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Pingren. Perfect, all right. I'm just gonna share my slides here. Perfect, all right, wonderful. Um, well, thank you all for that introduction. Um, like uh, Ray said, my name is Dr. Courtney Vengren. I'm the Director of Assessment and Faculty Development here at the College of Veterinary Medicine, um, to be clear. I am not a veterinarian. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about my background and how I came um, to be in this role and uh, involved in data visualization. Um, but by the end of the day, I hope that you're able to um, have some resources and methods, ways that you can visualize your assessment data. And thank you all for filling out those polls. That kind of helps me. I've got an example I'm going to go over. Um, and that kind of helps me um, think through um, how I'm going to present that to you all in a little bit. Um, so before, well, as we start, I do um, want to tell you a little bit about myself and also um, some of my assumptions about you all. Um, since this is a webinar and I don't have you in person, um, I've kind of made some baseline assumptions. So you also might have some assumptions about me, so let's go over those. Um, I just want you to know that I am not a graphic designer. In no way do I have any training really or background in graphic design. I have no art degrees. So I am just like you. I am, like Dr. Van Dyke said, I'm a self-proclaimed data nerd and I'm a social scientist by training. So everything we're going to talk about today is based on what I have either learned on the job or in my spare time because this was an interest of mine. And so I want you to know that you can do this and you don't need any special skills or training beyond what you're doing right now and attending some workshops, webinars, conferences. Um, everything that I've learned has either been through books, uh, webinars, YouTube videos, or uh, tutorials online. And so if your needs do extend kind of beyond what we're gonna cover today as far as the basics, um, usually I will pull in a actual graphic designer. I have a good friend uh, that collaborates with me on a lot of things. And so when I do need that advanced expertise, um, it's good to reach out, reach out to those professionals because they can often do more from the design side, uh, whereas I can do more from the data side. And so it's a really good partnership if you do have that resource available. But I will talk um, a little bit more about my background uh, because really if I can do this, you can as well. And I also want to say that everything that I am either showcasing or using during this webinar is free or should be free if you work at, you know, a higher institution, um, academic institution, or a large organization that provides you with basic software like Microsoft. Um, I am cheap. And so I try to look for those free um, or open source resources because I'm also a former high school teacher and we are very good at pinching pennies. Um, so, and then my assumptions about you all as an audience is that you do have a reasonable amount um, of experience with assessment data and academic data in general, since this is uh, through Weave and we're focused more on that academic uh, side of things. So most of my examples will be academic based, a lot of classroom based examples. Um, some of you might be institutional researchers, you said you're mostly assessment professionals. Um, Sometimes we have some faculty that are just interested in this, some program managers that are being asked to do um, some data visualization. So I kind of tend to shoot for the middle with assuming that everyone's pretty confident in Excel and everyone's pretty good at using their assessment data um, as I go through my examples. And 
So with that, um, I'm just gonna start by telling you how I've arrived today. So I began my career as a biology teacher in a struggling high school in Southwest Virginia. And I really loved teaching, um, but it was often frustrating. I loved my students, but it often felt more like my co-teachers and I were cogs in the educational machine, and we were constantly just working towards this one goal of the state standardized exam. That was the only metric that mattered and I had so much evidence from my students' lab work, from test scores, from quizzes, that I could really show how much they had learned, but none of it mattered, and I didn't have a way to convey that to my principals, to my school board. Um, I had that information. I could see it in my spreadsheets and in my grade books and on all of their paper and pencil assignments, but the only way that my teaching was measured uh, was by that one state exam and that's the only way my students are measured and it was really frustrating. So eventually I um, realized this wasn't you know working for me. I, I loved teaching. I still love my kids and still um, in touch with some of them even though they're now in graduate school and I feel really old. <laughs> but um, I realized I wanted to find a way that I could make an impact um, broader than what I was doing as a high school teacher and find some way that I could uh, use this data. And so I went back to get uh, my PhD in education at Virginia Tech, and I was kind of just at that point of figuring out my dissertation topic after changing it, you know, three, four dozen times, as you do. Um, and so I knew I'd wanted to focus on evaluation and education or assessment, uh, but that's as far as I'd gotten. And so my university was having this uh, evaluation person come to speak so I thought you know I'll go take our workshop since the department was paying for students to go and there was probably going to be free food you know graduate student motivation there <laughs> so um, I sat down in the lecture hall to listen to Dr. Stephanie Evergreen tell me about data visualization and so that was the day that everything really fell into place for me everything that I cared about everything that I'd been trying to force together into a career path suddenly perfectly aligned we had the assessment data statistics and a way to make people care about that data a way to demonstrate the impact that I wasn't able to demonstrate as a high school teacher a way that I could have taken all of those data points and really told a story about my students about my teaching our program and everything and so in that workshop, I learned that we can take our data, our, as assessment professionals, our rows and rows of spreadsheets or SPSS output, and we can translate it into something that matters and that makes sense to people who don't typically speak our assessment language. It's something that we can share to demonstrate program impact and a way that we can convey what we already know as professionals working with that data every day that our programs are making an impact, that our students are finding success, and that we're making a difference. And so creating these visuals really mattered because visuals matter. For most of us, I would, a majority of us, we are able-bodied, sighted individuals. That's not the case for everyone, um, but we do process most of our information every day in a visual manner. We use visuals everywhere. So, I mean, if you think about driving, half the signs are visual. There's not words on a lot of those signs, um, but it does, it speeds up our processing time and it also overcomes any language barriers that we may have. That visual tells us everything we need to know and it's a way to communicate clearly what's important. And so the research also shows that this data visualization matters. Azam and colleagues found that the use of data visualizations can provide a better means of communicating impacts on student success and visuals can also help our students in assessing and monitoring their own learning. And the use of data visualization can even result in a more effective education. So after I learned all this through um, Dr. Evergreen's uh, one workshop that I took, um, I worked for the next year and a half. I finished my PhD and I continued just to study data visualization in my spare time. I had an, a, a postdoc and assessment um, that wasn't the full focus, but it allowed me to use some of those skills just as an assessment 
new assessment professional. Um, I could harness some of those data visualization skills that I'd learned through that workshop. Um, and then I was able to study a little bit more, go to a couple conferences and go to a couple you know, sessions at a conference. Um, but those were really the main um, avenues for which I gained the knowledge that I have. And I still continue to develop my data visualization skills today in this role. And so hopefully, as you can see, I've not taken any special coursework. Um, I've not done, you know, a degree in this. This is, these are all things that you can learn um, on, you know, your own time or as, you know, an assessment professional, it is part of your job to be able to communicate that assessment data. So I really want to encourage you to look into this if this is something that you feel would broaden your impact of your data and be able to tell your assessment story. And so we'll get into um, some specifics on and examples in a bit. But first, let's just go over what data visualization is. So data visualization is the use of evidence-based practice, whether it's teaching or programs, some type of evidence for the way that we do things. And we have data from that evidence-based practice. And then when we combine that with a visual, we're able to tell the story of that teacher of the classroom, of the student, of the program, or even of your college. So it's a really impactful way that we can get across um, the information that we have in those spreadsheets um, to a broader audience who may not be as involved with our program. So let's look at an example. So here's an example. Uh, we can see the data about student performance in, this is a pretend biology course, I should also say, um, all of the data and examples I'm going to show you today are um, not real data, they're not student data. Um, these are all ones that I've just kind of fudged the data from other things that I've done, so we're not um, sharing any private um, or restricted data. So this example is from a pretend biology course, and we can use things like this to help our students identify where they're learning um, and maybe where they're studying needs to go. So we can see um, the points possible, the class average, and then our pretend students' points. And the uh, colors are um, coded by topic in this case. So, so we can help our students see that maybe they need to study that basics of life a little bit more. And it also helps us see, as maybe the instructor, that we only had one assignment on that and the others did have more weight in the course. So we can have a discussion around what's gonna be on the final, how much weight students should put on that, um, how they should maybe focus their studying. And so it gives them a way to harness their data and uh, focus on how they want to move forward and where they might be able to make some changes. We can apply these same principles to a program, um, to class level data, um, and as we can see here, to the individual student uh, level data. But I do want to be clear, this isn't just creating any old chart. This is a refined practice that focuses in on what really matters. It leaves no data behind and it allows us to hone in on the main point. And so we're gonna look at another story now. This is a pre and post opinion survey from a space science course. So this is a more traditional example of a data visualization. So we have two data sources here, our before and our after, and we have two bar graphs. And so this is good, this is a, data, this is a visualization of our data but it takes a lot for me to understand the story here. It takes a lot for me to understand what this person wants me to know about their course, about this question. And so if we apply some basic data visualization principles, we can see that this is the same data, and we can see that there was a statistically significant increase in the amount of students that strongly disagreed with this statement, statement that space is basically a cold and empty place, uh, before and after the course. And so that statistical significance is indicated by the red line there. Typically I would have, you know, a little um, piece underneath that uh, explains that that's our statistical significance one. Um, and so we can see that we had a change in the student opinion by highlighting that one line. 
um, we had a change in the way that they view the world. And this tells me a lot more than a test score. This tells me where I have actual statistically significant change. And so we can kind of see the uh, differences here. Uh, we do probably just have this data in our spreadsheet somewhere. Most of us have spreadsheets like this. And if we use the right visual, we're really able to tell that story uh, in a much faster way because our audience isn't having to do comparisons. We're doing the comparison for them. And we can get across the message uh, to someone who might not be familiar with the course, with what we're trying to discuss with them. And so thinking through some of these principles we're gonna talk about today of data visualization can allow us to tell that story in a uh, much more cohesive and concise manner. So if we have a grant proposal, uh, administrative meetings, annual reviews, programmatic data, we can now come armed with more data than ever before. Um, but often when it's stuffed into this spreadsheet or a chart that isn't intuitive, it can be challenging. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, data visualization isn't just some new millennial thing. Uh, in fact, the history of data visualization is far older than you would expect. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois is one of the pioneers of this field. And in the late 1800s, Du Bois was trying to find a way to convey the life experiences and the struggles of Black Americans at the time. And so he created this visual over and over uh, 50 other hand-drawn data visualizations to show the reason why Black America was being held back. And he had to tell their story. So he developed data visualization as a way to do it. And I just wanted to acknowledge his contributions to this field and say that if he could do that with no computers, no weave to help collect data, no Excel spreadsheets, if he could do that in 1880, then we can easily create visuals to tell our story now. So um, I hope that's some inspiration for you. I, when I came across this book earlier, uh, I guess last year, I was just floored by the amazing um, visuals that uh, he was able to create, things that I couldn't even do in Excel if I tried. Um, and the book is uh, Data Portraits, um, if you want to look that up. And I'll have a list of resources at the end. But before we start pulling out our charts and graphs, um, there are a couple questions that we need to ask ourselves before we begin engaging in data visualization. So let's go over those. I've got five questions here, and we're gonna kind of go over these one at a time, and then we'll get into some principles of data visualization, and then we'll work through an example. So my first question is what data do we have? Uh, like Ray said, uh, we've previously talked about qualitative data with the speaker last week. Um, we also have our quantitative data. I would say for me, um, as the director of assessment here, I have uh, more quantitative data. I've got my student exam scores. We do have a licensing exam for a veterinary professional, so I have that data. I have a predictor exam for that. Um, and we also have a lot of survey data in a uh, Likert uh, form and then some other metrics from our different al alumni and employer surveys also have our grade book of data. So we have a lot of quantitative data that I can think through about what message I need to convey. But we also do have that qualitative data. Um, comment sections are one of my favorite things to create a visual for, and also uh, timelines. It's another really good visual. But as we kind of collect in our heads all the different uh, pieces of data, we also need to think about is there more analysis to be done? Is that data ready for visualization? And as most of you are uh, assessment professionals, I would assume that you're the ones that are doing that analysis, either in SPSS or however you do it. Uh, but thinking through what visual, what do we need to create? Do we need to do additional statistics on this? Do we have those um, statistical significance uh, figures if we need those? Is it a percentage? Um, is it some Likert scale data and how do we want to handle that? Do we want to do percentages or mean scores? What's your, you know, feeling on that? Um, are there any ranges? For us, we do our ranges of salary with medians. So do I have all those figures? Um, anything like that. Should we find or pull any quotes maybe? Um, any pictures? Is there a logic model? that we need to either create or find that would tell the story of this data. So thinking through 
is the analysis done? Am I answering the question? But what is, oh, that's blue. what is that question? So what are the key points of our message? Why are you being asked to create this visual or what made you want to create um, this story and tell the story of the data? Um, sometimes it may be that the dean asked you for a report. Uh, it could be that this is just your annual uh, report on your alumni survey or maybe for accreditation purposes. So what are the key points of this message? What do people really need to know about this program? And with that, I also want to emphasize that we don't need to visualize every single part of the data. Uh, there still should be that space where we do have that textual explanation and we have, um, you know, only those key points visualized to really drive home that message. Uh, also thinking through uh, what was the question we were asking when we started looking at this data and does this visual after we've created it answer that? also good to have an outside individual look at our visuals when we are done to say what can you tell me from this knowing nothing about the data and what should those people be able to glean from that data visualization and then our final question um, what important facts often get overlooked as assessment professionals we know our data sets very well and we, you could also probably point out a couple places where you feel like those data points are being overlooked and people aren't maybe getting the message about the program that you know because you've worked with the data. And so we don't want to have our audience or our deans or faculty playing Where's Waldo with their data. That's not the story we're trying to tell. I love my Where's Waldo book, but that's not where we're going. Uh, so we really want to be able to make sure that there, if there are any muddy points, we're able to make those clear with visuals. And if there's anything that we know that's often overlooked, that we can uh, focus in on that information. So what does a good visual look like? We've thought through all our questions. We have our data analyzed. We know the message that we need to tell. Now, how do we tell it? And so once we've answered those questions, we can start crafting our visual. But it's helpful to have some principles to go on. So I've taken these principles of good design. Uh, these were uh, drafted by Dieter Rams, who is a well-known architect. And I've kind of modified them a little bit for the world of data. So um, his principles um, here, the first one is uh, good design or good data visualization is innovative. So how we're visualizing data now is very different than the 3D graphs of the 90s and the pie charts. And we will continue to innovate and develop better design to tell the story of our data um, as we move forward. So it should be innovative and it should be um, modern and current. And then uh, good visualization, good design should make that data useful. As assessment professionals, I find that most of us are very passionate about the use of our data and that data was collected to be used. It was analyzed to be used. You ran all of those tests and combed through that data set to make sure that there were no errors so that it could be used. And so this visualization process should make that data useful find it's one of the biggest reasons to engage in data visualization. And our visuals should also be aesthetically pleasing. We want people to do more than glance over them. We want them to engage with them and really understand the meaning of that data. Also, our good, well-designed visuals should make the data understandable. Sometimes, like I've said, those rows and rows of spreadsheets are a headache. Sometimes we actually miss connections ourselves, even though we are the assessment professionals and we know that data. Good design helps us understand our data. And so sometimes we make those visuals just for our own uh, knowledge so we can make sure that we're not missing anything. And then good design should also be unobtrusive. Good visuals are unobtrusive. They don't distract you with unnecessary outlines or 3D images or animations or loud colors, they should act as a microphone, not a megaphone for your data. And this one is especially important, and I think all of us as assessment professionals could agree that good visualization, good design should be honest. We've probably seen this more than once, 
that your visual or someone's visual, hopefully not yours, has maybe an altered axis that makes it look a little bit different than it would if that axis maybe started at a true zero. And so we never want to use a visual to make our data something it isn't. Um, I've seen people dissolve whole categories just to make the visual fit, and that's not good design. It should be honest. And our good, well-designed data visualization should be long-lasting. We saw the example from the 1800s, and I would say that that visual is very long-lasting. 10 years, 20 years from now, uh, we should still be able to look at that same report and understand it. Um, they, our visuals are not fashion. They are tools that should be able to stand the test of time, um, as W.E.B. Du Bois's have. And our design should be thorough down to the last detail. And we'll look at this when we go over our example. Um, this means every aspect of a graphic is considered. The shape, the balance, the color, the font, and the size of that font, as well as the data. Everything should have some attention paid to it as you're moving through the process. And then this one, uh, his principle was that it's environmentally friendly. I find that most of our visualization and most of our assessment work is as we're mostly computer-based um, at this point. So I kind of changed this to be economically friendly, uh, which I mean by that, I mean your time. I think it's important that our design efforts also be economical. This shouldn't be where you spend a bulk of your time and this should be something that you can find the time to do um, with minimal expense. Uh, and with that, there are several ways that you can, if there's data that you often work with, for me, I'll go back to my example of our alumni surveys, we do it every year. So I have files set up as templates so that I can import my new data and those visuals are ready to go. And I don't have to waste any time um, recreating them every year because I know it's something that I'm going to need every year. And then finally, our uh, design should involve as little design as possible. Less is more and you don't need to over design or over color or overthink your visuals. We don't need those shadows and backgrounds um, to drive home your point. Only the essentials should go into those visualizations. And I will have this as a PDF for folks. Um, we will have that available for you to download as well as a PDF of the slides and resources. So these principles are well accepted in most areas of design, architecture, um, and in print design. And so I'll reference these as we go through this example and look at some different charts. So here's the example we're going to walk through. I have this just as screenshots um, in this PowerPoint uh, because I um, have a Mac and some of the clicks and um, menu locations differ from Mac to PC. So for the sake of our large audience, uh, I just did screenshots so we can move through this um, quickly. There are tutorials out there that will walk walk you through step by step. Um, we'll chat about that in a little bit. But we're gonna work through this example. Here we have a set of data from sections of an exam in a course. And so all I've done to prepare the data is to calculate the averages for each section of the exam, the pretend exam. So most of you said you're fairly well advanced in Excel. You probably know how to create a regular bar chart. Took me about two clicks. I can make this basic chart in Excel, and that compares the mean and the points possible. Our chart is okay. It is not fantastic, um, but if I just need a quick look for myself, this would probably work. But if I want to make a point about this test or the data to maybe the faculty member, to the dean, um, to our alumni, I would like to make a few edits to make um, our data stand out and to apply those principles. So the first thing that I want to do with this data set is I'm going to apply my university color palette. So if you are at a university, you do probably have a color palette. If you do not know what that is, um, or some of you may know, uh, as I know uh, Ray Van Dyke is very close to Virginia Tech and he knows their color palette to be maroon and orange. Most universities also have a secondary color palette. So I'm currently at Iowa State University. We have our primary palette here on the left, and we also have the secondary color palette. If you just search your institution's name and color palette, you're probably gonna find a brand guideline that gives you this information. So this is a very handy thing to have saved um, somewhere that you can use when you're creating these visuals. 
There's also a way to save these colors in Excel so you don't have to re-enter them every time. But you can see the codes here. Um, the hex and the RGB codes are the ones that you would need to know to create these visuals um, in Excel. Um, in a Mac, the hex codes are the best option. If you have a PC, those RGB values are going to be the easiest for you to enter into Excel to create the color um, so that you have your institutional color palette. And if you're at a separate organization that's not uh, an institution, you don't know their color palette, there are, um, if you have a logo, there are ways to pull the colors out of that logo or ask the person who designed the logo. But I want to apply this color palette to my visual because I want my data to say that this is from Iowa State University. The, um, this chart, air blue and orange, um, for anybody Virginia-based, that says UVA to me. And as a Hokie, as a Virginia Tech graduate, I never want my graph to say it's from UVA. <laughs> So now that I'm at Iowa State, I want to make sure my uh, data does say Iowa State. So here I've applied the color palette. Um, again, I'm not going through the full click through of this. If you know Excel pretty well, you probably know how to change your colors. Um, and if you do need specifics on how to enter those hex or RGB codes, um, you can shoot me an email and be happy to chat with you about that more. But so um, I've applied our color palette, but I'd still like to make this a little bit cleaner so I can better compare my data points. So I'm now going to move the mean, that class mean, to a secondary axis. So a couple magic clicks. And this is a lot better. Instead of my eye jumping back and forth, left and right, for each one of those bars, this allows me to move in a linear fashion that's much easier for me to compare. And then I also remove the line. So I'm going to go back so you can see the lines that were there previously. I removed the lines and it looks a lot cleaner. Um, so I've cleaned up that graph and so this, uh, using those principles of design, um, I've made it a lot more aesthetically pleasing. And again, with, the, with using the colors, um, that's our principle of being thorough down to the last detail. And so we have something now that is minimally designed, it's unobtrusive, and it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing. But I'd still like to make a few more edits. Um, we need a title, and the font is tiny. If this was um, in a uh, paper, in an infographic, or on a um, uh, research poster. All right, so that looks pretty good. So we've now utilized our principles of making the design unobtrusive and making sure that we are thorough with that text, with the font, making sure it's the appropriate size. Um, but hypothetically, let's say that I want to draw attention to the pathology portion of this exam. The scores were the lowest here, and it had the least amount of questions based on this information. So maybe I want to discuss this with the students, or maybe um, the instructor in the course, or the curriculum committee, but let's draw attention to this portion. And so now we can see exactly what I want to point out. I'm not leaving any data behind, and I've made my point very clear. If you handed this graph to anybody, you could ask them, what is this person probably going to talk about? And you would say pathology. And so I can communicate what I know about this, the important information, um, by using those principles of making our data useful and understandable and making the data honest. All of the information is still there. It's still intact. We've just recessed the colors on the ones we're not talking about today. So in this meeting, in this um, conference, whatever it is, we're clearly going to talk about whatever is happening with that pathology portion. So by using those highlights, um, it really allows us to focus in on what that key message is. So let's go back and look at our first graph. So can you believe that's the same data? Um, for me, the one that we've modified makes a far greater impact and tells a much better story. We can compare um, the points possible in the class mean a lot quicker. We can also tell what our talking point is, what the main point is, um, and then with the either if there's a speaker, if there's a report that has some text, it can elaborate on what the main point is. And so once you learn just a few basic clicks, I can create this visual in about two minutes. I've timed it a couple of times. Even going at a very conservative pace, it doesn't take me very long. And again, like I said, you can set up templates so that you can create um, these visuals if there's something that you do often. Once you have 
harness to these principles, it's pretty easy to create these. And I'll have some resources that walk you through how to do these things. Um, Cause like I said, some of you are on Mac, some of you are on PCs. Um, so I just went with the screenshots to help you walk through just the idea of why these visualizations might be useful in your practice. Um, so as you can hopefully see, using this data can reveal powerful and profound insights into your teaching, your program, uh, your college, what have you. Data visualization can provide us with ways to view data differently that we might, uh, we might not otherwise, and it also gives us a better chance of detecting those obscured patterns and connections that's so important for a quality assessment and to find out what's going on within all of that data. And we do have that data readily available as assessment professionals. That's data that you've generated and analyzed that you can really make an impact for your college, your institution, your university. And so those resources are out there. And so um, here are some resources, and I will also have this as a PDF for you all on um, Eve. And uh, a couple of things to point out here, Dr. Evergreen's blog has a tutorial on how to do this. It has the exact steps for making this exact same graph that I've created. And so that's a really good resource um, if you would like, if you have a need to create this one. She has tons of other ones out there and she also has two excellent books that walk you through how to create these visuals. Um, she does a much better job. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. So I just wanted to point you towards that resource. Same thing for Ann K. Emery. She has a lot of design focused strategies and resources uh, that will allow you to create some of these visuals. That way you've got the book, you've got the resource or website that you can refer to again and again. Um, Cause I find that pretty helpful. You've done it once and then, you know, two weeks later you come back, you don't exactly remember. So I really like to direct people to those resources that they can reference again and again. Uh, a couple uh, other uh, ones here. Color Brewer is a really excellent, um, option for accessibility. It gives you uh, color options for colorblind uh, individuals and print color uh, options. So that's a good resource to make sure that you um, are doing what's best for accessibility. And uh, Google Charts has some good options and some not so much, but it's always a good jumping off point for me to think through what charts might be good for my data. I like to look at it um, as examples. And then Data Wrapper is a slightly more fancy version in Excel. Uh, there are free and paid uh, versions of that that allow you to do some data visualizations if you're kind of at that next level, if you're very comfortable with this in Excel. And then Tableau is another option. Uh, it also has a free and paid version. I just want to caution you that last time I checked, Tableau's free version does make your data public, so I never want to put student data in there. So make sure you're thinking through those things. If you are using web-based resources uh, that are free especially, make sure you understand what's happening to that data um, and just make sure you know uh, whether or not it would be safe to put that student data in there. Um, so that's my one caution with Tableau. And then word clouds for some of that qualitative data. I love to have my faculty put their uh, student evaluation comments through Word Cloud. There, I, so if some of you are faculty and have been faculty, you know that those student evaluations can be a little stressful. And it's really pretty fun to stick those comments all into a Word Cloud. It's easier to digest. You can see the things that pop out with uh, less stress than having to read all of those, which sometimes make us very uncomfortable to have to reflect on our teaching practice. So I love the Word Cloud options for survey comment sections. Um, that's a lot of fun. And then timelines, uh, this is a great resource for uh, doing high quality timelines. And then for those super advanced folks, Inkscape is a free open source software. Um, it's similar to a very expensive graphic design software, but Inkscape, Inkscape is open source. It does have a very steep learning curve, but if you're on the more advanced end of the spectrum, you've done everything you can possibly do in Excel with data visualizations, you're very confident with that, um, then I would encourage you to check out Inkscape uh, that. And then also I will have my email address on our resources page uh, through Weave. If you have any questions at all, I am always more than happy to uh, chat about a visualization, to look your visualization over, to make a suggestion on how you might want to visualize some data. So I will be happy to be a resource as well. And so in closing, I just want to encourage you all to tell your data story. Don't leave that data behind and find that data that you have the access to through uh, your work, through your program, 
and find those resources. Watch a YouTube video on how to do some of these things. Uh, go to a workshop or maybe ask a graduate student who's very good at this to help you. Uh, it's something you can definitely learn on the job. I did all of uh, the visuals that you saw today um, just through practice and learning on the job and I made time for it. And it's definitely a really enhanced my assessment practice and it's given me the ability to tell the story of my students and our college in um, a much more impactful way. So I wanna encourage you uh, to share the story of your programs as well. And so with that, um, we have some time for questions. So I will turn that back over to Amber. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. I learned a lot. Um, and I know we did have a couple of questions come in. One of them was the workshop that you mentioned in the very beginning when you were kind of describing mm -hmm. your journey. Could you just say the, the name of that again and the presenter? Sure. That is uh, Stephanie Evergreen. Okay. And that is in the resources. She does have kind of a list of where she is speaking on her website. And she... Um, this was several years ago, but she's also at the, was at the time available to come to institutions to do a two-day workshop and training. Um, I highly recommend if your institution is able to bring her in. Uh, it's very, uh, very useful for faculty, graduate students, for your assessment office staff to have her come and do this workshop and yeah, open it up to, to the broader college, um, especially with data science uh, increasing as a discipline and a major, those folks certainly um, are interested in this. So I highly recommend having her come in and do a workshop if at all possible, but that'll be on the resource page. I kind of thought that that's what you were going to say, but then I thought, well, I better ask and make sure, but that was yep. highlighting, that was the very top resource too. So that'll all be available when we post all of this on our site. Um, the other one that, that came through um, was if you have a specific software program that you typically recommend, and I'm going to guess that you're mostly recommending Excel. Yep, I mean, I like I said, I'm a, I was a high school teacher. Um, I was raised by two teachers, and I like things that are simple and accessible. And Excel has um, enough features that I really feel like you can do the majority of high quality data visualizations uh, for assessment, general assessment data, stuff I've worked with every day um, in Excel. Some of those visuals do take um, some additional tweaks and some steps to work through to make them um, really impactful. Um, but those resources are the way that I learned to do that through Excel. And so I really highly recommend um, Excel because again, also you have the full control over your data. Mm -hmm. I like Tableau. It does some really fancy things that I can't do in Excel, but we do not have an institutional license for it. So I do not use it with my student data um, just because I, I need to keep that confidential. Um, but yeah, Excel is absolutely my go-to. Got a few more coming in. Um, I'll read this first one. Most programs submit summary data that may not lend itself very well to visualizations. Do you have any suggestions for how to get raw assessment data or ways to encourage programs to submit raw data to make those visualizations? Sure. So it really depends on uh, your how much pull you have <laughs> at your institution. Um, but if you're if you're getting summary data. Um, it may be good to go back to the person that provided that data and say, you know, for accreditation, I'd really like to be able to tell the story of this program. Could you provide me the data on this? And sometimes if it is, you know, a, a, a confidentiality issue, we certainly understand that. Um, but letting them know what you plan to do with that and why you're asking for that data uh, may be helpful for you in, in gathering that. And it could be that they think that maybe you just didn't want all of that data um, in your inbox, but letting them know this, I'd really like to showcase this. Um, I have some questions about this. Could you give me more information? Just kind of starting that conversation and being very transparent about how you're going to use it and why it's important. Next question, is there an ideal preferred ratio for height and width in charts to avoid distorting slopes, et cetera? That's a great question. So question. <laughs> um, to avoid distorting them, my main thing is to watch your axis. Excel, although I love it, um, does some automatic axis um, 
guesstimations for you. So it will arbitrarily set those access numbers based on the data. So if you have data that's in the 10,000s, it will sometimes start at an arbitrary number. And so my first step is to check that access and make sure that that is appropriate and that it makes sense for that data. And then as far as height and width, um, if you're doing it in Excel, the way I typically do it is then I take, um, I pull that out if it's in a, uh, another Excel or Microsoft program, if I'm putting it in a Word document, it translates very well and it doesn't matter how I drag or uh, pull that um, data. It still has the same ratio roughly, but if you change it to um, a picture format, then we can really get some distortions in there. So I recommend keeping that in its um, kind of smart format where it talks to the Excel spreadsheet if at all possible. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, the other thing you want to think about with that is the white space balance. And so looking to see if we have pulled this too far that we're losing some of that white space and it's getting too um, busy, then uh, we maybe need to pull back. And I usually like to keep those, um, you know, to a, to a smaller, maybe a, a two by three format if I'm on a regular um, word size document. Um, but yeah, just, just the, the uh, access is my biggest thing to, to watch right there. As long as that's still where it should be, uh, it's usually all right. Next question. What are some of your tips, maybe like your top tips in Excel for people who are beginners and then people who are maybe a little bit more intermediate? Sure. Um, so for beginners, I would say just get a pretend data set. Just make it like, you know, the data that you work with, you know, um, what uh, things you're typically asked to do. So maybe take a data set like that and modify it to have some fake data in there that you can just play with. And so make some different visualizations, look at uh, Dr. Evergreen's website and kind of work through some of those examples with that data. So you're more comfortable um, with making those graphs because once you know those different types of graphs, you can think, oh, I have programmatic data from this survey. This would be great in this type of graph. This really shows the key points um, in this way. Or, you know, I need to show some data about um, different, our, we do our um, graduate salary averages in different states. How do I do that um, in a graph? And think of those things that you typically work with and just play with the data. Um, get used to changing the colors, find out where your hex codes and your RGB values go. Um, and for folks that are more advanced, um, then certainly that's when uh, you might wanna look at some other resources or work on creating an infographic. Um, invest a little bit of time if it's appropriate for your work. If this is something that you're often, you know, you need to present this um, in a cohesive manner. We know that our administrators are very busy. And if we can do a one page summary, even if we're still handing them that 30 page report, if we can make a nice infographic that is a one page summary of our most important data points, that can really go a long way to taking that message to the dean, uh, the provost, what have you. So I'd say look into um, how to create infographics and um, Inkscape is the, is the way that I typically do that. And that is uh, kind of our higher level um, design. And then also I, sh I should put that on there. Let me might write myself a note. I'll add Canva is another excellent resource for creating infographics. Um, it does have a free version. Um, it's a little, you have to do a little modifying to their resources, but I have done that a couple times. So I will add that into the, um, to my resources thing before I send it over um, for Weave to post. That's a really good resource for creating those infographics and uh, those kind of one pagers to get the point of your program across. So Amber, can I um, throw in something real fast? Of course. <laughs> um, first of all, Cordia, it was absolutely wonderful. So much, so much to learn. Um, it's so, so much to be helpful. Um, but you know, something that you said just kind of struck me, and that was when you were talking about this notion of if you could bring this particular speaker or anyone to campus to talk about this work. And I'm thinking about this whole notion of data visualization and how it really is a common topic that would be a great way for us to engage with faculty, not just about assessment, but about teaching and learning in lots of different ways. You know, everyone, regardless of, of discipline, needs to, to, to learn how to do this data visualization. And with, with uh, using 
your office, the assessment office as kind of a resource for that would be a great way to kind of develop partnerships and, and provide services to the faculty. Um, so I think that's, that's a really great idea that, that could certainly improve relationships sometimes that for if you're, if you're trying to get faculty buy-in or faculty engagement. Absolutely. I, that's definitely something we've seen here. Um, our office also supports uh, research acti activity for faculty because we have two statisticians in our office and we're the only statisticians in the college. So we do collaborate with faculty on research projects, on grants, on publications. And so this is a service that my office does offer if they um, I've actually done uh, data visualizations for their PMT packets. So I've had faculty ask for that. Um, so making faculty aware that um, this is a service you can offer and um, the more you can work with them, the more, you know, they trust their assessment people once they understand our motives that we really are here to help your programs and to show your data story. Um, so yeah, it's an excellent way um, to be able to uh, offer additional services to your faculty and uh, get some more buy-in with them. And, and my office actually does um, trainings for faculty. We have a seminar series. And so that's something um, that we talk about with them. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. Excellent point. Excellent. Yes, I could totally picture a workshop where you bring your data and your laptop and you leave with uh, a product. That would be really, really helpful. I know I would have loved to have attended something like that when I was on campus. Um, I thought of one more question. Um, I would love to hear kind of one of your success stories from doing this type of work. Oh, sure. Um, I would say, um, my, one of my, I guess, my favorite ones is, um, we, I used to, uh, work at Virginia Tech for, um, a program that focused on, um, uh, women and, uh, underrepresented groups in the quantitative sciences. And so we were looking at how best to uh, retain those students in the quantitative sciences and um, to track them over time. So we had, um, let's see, we had six years of cohorts um, starting and then so we followed them for all of their years until graduation. So I mean, thousands of data points. We had um, their GPAs from just their regular fall spring GPAs. We had a, a STEM GPA calculated. We had a physics GPA. We had a math GPA. We had a chemistry GPA. We had their academic standing for the program. I mean, we have so much data on those uh, students. And so uh, it, it was based on a grant and you know all like all grants they end at some point and so the program we had to really make the push to the college to adopt the program and so uh, we were able to um, have discussions with the college and show them uh, where that data was coming from and that we had success with these students that we were able to retain uh, women in the quantitative sciences and uh, underrepresented groups and really prove to the college that this was a program that was working. It was worth supporting uh, with their funding now that the um, grant funding was ending and to uh, let them know that, that this would be a very big um, you know, impact for those students and for the program you know, as part of the, the mission and to have them adopt that. So it was really amazing to be able to provide that information to drill down through all of those thousands of rows of spreadsheets uh, to be able to identify the impact that that program had made on those students and to show the college that it was worth their investment to keep the program going. Um, so yeah, that was definitely one of my, my favorite opportunities. But um, I just want to let folks know I will be available. My email address will be um, there for you all if you have questions or if you want to chat more. I'm happy to, to zoom in um, with anyone who has an additional interest in this. If you do have more specific questions about your specific data, I'm always happy to chat about that. We're getting lots of thank yous in the uh, chat box and in the questions. So I think you were very thorough and people are excited to maybe go back to their desk and begin this work. Um, 
Just to point out to everybody where these things will live on the Weave site, um, our address is weaveeducation.com. You go over to Knowledge Center and click, and then just make sure that you scroll down, and this will, will move down into here, and you'll be able to open it up, and it will have, um, you'll also get this in email if you registered, so you'll have a link to the recording and the PDFs of the presentation and the other resources that Dr. Ringren mentioned, and so I'll be sending out an email with all of that by the end of the week, so you have all of that. Feel free to share it with others if you knew somebody who would have enjoyed this and couldn't come today. Um, if you're interested in other webinars, we did mention the one that we had last week um, about telling your story, um, your assessment story kind of more um, verbally, more of a narrative, and that was a really good one too. And we have all kinds of resources in here. All of this is completely free, and we really appreciate Dr. Wengren and these other experts um, contributing to the community in this way. Uh, thank you again for coming. We really would appreciate you filling out the survey just so that we can continue to provide information that's useful for everybody. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we very much enjoyed hosting you. Thank you to Ray and Dr. Vengren. And we also have another one of our team on the call, Brianne. She's the one who makes all these fun pages and sets up the Zooms. And so she does all that really important work behind the scenes. So we appreciate her too. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Amber. Thanks, Courtney. It was wonderful. Thank it was. you all. I learned a ton. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great rest of the week. <laughs>